today i would like to present to you some of the principles of jainism which i found in my life as business practitioner business leader and now as a scholar very relevant today we here you know all around a noise a disturbance people are crying no prosperity is there but still we see more and more discontent and if we see the reasons we see the greed of the business the increasing level of expectations or demands of the consumers asking for more and more environment going worse day by day and we see the effect etc etc what are all these suggesting they all suggest that the present or the recent principles of development as envisioned by management or our authorities policy makers need a change and while i talk to you of jainism today because the situation was i feel the situation was similar 2600 years ago when mahavir came into the world okay only difference is that the level of these changes were localized they were not communicated all over the world today with the <coughs> advent of information technology and communication technology the whole world is becoming a village so what happens today here at sms varanasi immediately our friends from the media and visitors they communicated to the world whole world and that's the big change and that means that whatever the principles we had earlier they need a new look how can we use those principles to address the problems of today and my endeavor today is to address those issues and i believe that some of the founding principles of jainism like non violence we all talk of non violence then second is multiplicity of view points anekant it has many names we talk of pluralism we not talk of interfaith we talk of internationalizing business operations etc etc and the third is limiting possessions that means control the greed and look beyond so these are the basic principles that i think can form the pillars to develop a new strategy a new organization paradigm and a set of ethics or operating principles and this is what i will try to address today before i move there i will just take a few minutes to tell you some of the salient doctrines of jains which are slightly different from the others first is the definition of reality itself you know the beautiful thing here is we say reality is persistence with change nothing in this world is static or inert the whole system everything is evolving continuously trying to attain the higher levels of so whatever something you call it the second is and that's very important in today's world all living beings are equal you know this he is scheduled caste he is untouchable he is brahman or he is this or he is black he is white they have to give way to a feeling of equalness all living beings are equal and everybody wants happiness nobody wants pain these are some of the principles which are really the if we make them the backbone of our organization policy etc i will come to you we will see the change and third is living beings help each other if i want to achieve some of my objectives i cannot go solo i need others to support me achieve my objective 
and the third is dignity of right belief, right knowledge, and right conduct. It's not just conduct that I work hard. It is that I must have a belief. That belief should be supported by knowledge and hard work. So when all three of these we put together, success is assured. The next is <coughs> work. Nothing comes just on its own. I am the son of a king, so it does not mean that I will become the king. Now I have to work. I have to prove my credentials. My birth, my other things can help me. But ultimately I have to work. And here the doctrine of karma, karma siddhant of jains, is extremely important. Like Newton said, for every action there is an equal and opposite reaction. Jains say, as you sow, so shall you reap. The next is Aparigra, and I simply translated sharing surplus or charity for sustainable development. It's not that I keep on amassing wealth, build new buildings, flashy businesses. I have to share that with others. And the next, which is most important, I learned from Acharya Tulsi Ji, Reverend Acharya Tulsi Ji, self-improvement first before helping others to improve. Unless I am strong, unless I am knowledgeable, unless I am an example, I cannot ask others to emulate that. With these, I come to the three principles. Briefly, I will talk of those. What is Ahinsa? And here, I will just repeat the first chapter of Acharan, which is the most important and first limb of the Jain canons in which it says none of the living beings ought to be killed or deprived of life, ought to be ordered or ruled, ought to be enslaved or possessed, ought to be distressed or afflicted, and ought to be put to unrest and disquiet. My dear distinguished scholars and friends, see the difference how far we have taken the meaning of non-violence. It's not just killing. It's beyond. And this is the beauty of the non-violence, principle of non-violence of Jains. And next principle that we see in Jainism is that violence can be performed not by physical actions. It can be performed mentally. It can be performed by speech. Like Devki, you know, what is her name in Mahabharat? Uh, calling Duryodhan blind, son of a blind, is blind. And the cause of the entire Mahabharat is set. So, by mind, by speech, and by body. Body, of course, is an expression of violence. It's not the beginning. It can be performed by all these things. Or, if I admire somebody who is violent, or support, or ask others. I am, am non-violent, but I ask uh, Professor Krishna, please go and hit him. That is also violence. So we have to be very careful that what non-violence means. And the third and the most important compulsion to be non-violent is violence affects the violent person first before it affects the victim. And you will see this. When I become violent, my blood pressure will increase, I become tense, etc. I spend a lot of time planning for it, even before I start performing violence. And to implement this doctrine of non-violence, Mahavi very nicely explains it in another limb called Prashna Vyakran by 60 different synonyms of non-violence. And how do I become non-violent? And then he gives the names, compassion, tolerance, forgiveness, equanimity, friendship, kindness, security, etc. I just give you these because this is what we are going to see being applied in organization and management to achieve our results. Okay? And Martin Luther King and Nelson Mandela and today Hazare have used this. We have seen in our own life how non-violence has been used. The next principle is Anikant. And here we beautiful, Mahavi said, 
the differences in opinions and viewpoints among different people emanate from their intellectual capabilities and differences, and now this is important, and differences in the nature of things based on the definition of reality. Everything is changing. So what was true 10 years ago may not be hold true. When Einstein discovered the theory of relativity, when, when he was being, you know, honored, he said, he first bowed to Newton and said, Sir, when you found that was the truth, today knowledge is emerging and today we have a view that what you said that at that time about matter or the world does not hold true. So it is changing continuously. So this is what it is and we go on to see this, that truth in a way, metaphysically we say it's infinite and I am not capable of knowing everything unless I become all-knowing, the God or omniscient. And since I don't know the whole, I should not insist that I am right. I should, I should develop certain attitudes to respect the other's view because my knowledge is partial, your knowledge is partial, everybody else's knowledge is partial. So there should be an openness to accommodate. And for this, the three pillars that in Jainism we identify are tolerance, coexistence. Coexistence is very important. And this is based on, like yesterday, you know, one of the distinguished speakers said, nothing is absolutely good and nothing is absolutely bad. Good and bad coexist. And the third thing is relativity. My independence is dependent on respecting your independence also. And this is a very important principle. Because of time, I will not give you examples, but we see in our life all these things. Aparigra, generally people say aparigra means don't have any possessions. Just be a, you know, a, 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 a recluse and live in the forest. For us people or for the organization, I say it is limiting our wants, limiting our desires. Set limit, any limit, and as you go, learn the work art of sharing, planning back in the organization, etc., etc. And this is a very important principle. In fact, Jains are called Nirgrans or because Mahavir gave religious overtones to a parigra and called it bondage as the root cause of all problems. With these, with these principles, now I take the management issues. The management issues I divided into three categories. Whenever we start a business, the first thing is strategy, vision document. What is the, that the organization aims to achieve? And the second is organization and management. How do you organize people to work together to achieve your ob objective? And what is the management? And the third is day-to-day -day operations, which we call ethics. Here I will try to say one thing that we, you may see in my talk, organization and management being used interchangeably, but they are very different. And here, as you will see, the definition of the organization itself. See, Jain say, reality is persistence with change. Organization is an independent entity. I am the chairman of International School of Jain Studies, but I am not International School for Jain Studies. ISJS is a separate entity on its own. It wants to exist it wants to prosper and it wants to achieve its objectives that it has set. So this leads me to believe the word organization, it comes from organ, organic, that is, it is a living being. We have to treat an organization like a living being and like a living being, it also wants to stay forever in a happy mode. And here the definition of happiness is it wants to prosper, it wants to continue achieving its objectives and grow. 
because what is happiness? Level of happiness increases till we convert it into bliss. So here for organization, we have to ensure that the organization is treated as an organic entity, independent, and which wants to, you know, survive for as long as possible. And with this cherished goals of the organization, we have to set some index. What is the measure that we say that the organization is growing or happy? Today, most of us say, what is the shareholder's value? What is the, you know, value of my investment? Uh, how much profit is this making? Most of the finance people will talk to you of just how much profit a company is making to show. Here we have to change this. This mindset has to come. Profit is essential. It is like oxygen for us to breathe. Profit has to be made, but that is not the ultimate aim. The objective of the organization is to change this concept of gross national DP, GNDP, GP or GDP to an index which is now being researched a lot called Gross Naval National Index of Happiness. And here by happiness I mean it is a well-being, a wellness of all stakeholders, not just shareholders. If I am the management of, if I am the chairman, I am also involved. If you are the employees of the organization, you are also involved. Customers are involved. Suppliers are involved. Resources being used and inputs. Environment is important. Society is important. So here we have to take a holistic view of the welfare of all the organization. And of course, profit is to be made to ensure that these things happen. If the company is making a lot of profit, it must share it with its employees, it must share it with its customers, it must share it with its suppliers, and it must plow it back in the organization for R&D, coming up with new products, etc., etc. So this is what it is. Thus, and the head of the organization should invoke respect and following of all stakeholders. This is extremely important. I just give you an example that Lord Mahavira, when he attained omniscience or he became perfect human being, what did he do? He did not speak. He did not say anything even until he became a perfect being. So once he attained that and it became obvious that he had achieved certain level, then he starts. So this means, I would say, that we have to see that the leader of the organization has to be a man in whom all the stakeholders have confidence. They can depose con confidence. Now we come to organization and management. In Jainism, the word we use for organization is Sangh. Like in most of the religions, we have called it Sangh or congregation. And the constitutional, the constitution, organizational hierarchy, qualification and duties, etc., for different constitutions of the Sangh, code of con conduct, etc., are very well described in the literature. This leads us to the you know, to the direction that in an organization, all these issues should be well documented. They should be so that anybody, appointment of chairman, appointment of manager, their qualifications, their salaries, benefits, their duties, what they cannot do, all these, their hierarchy, relationship within and outside. They have to be very well documented and available to all stakeholders. I just give you some examples. As I said, Mahavir did not speak or deliver sermons or organize a sang till he attained omniscience. That is, I take it, make your product well proven before you launch. Make the organization so that its objectives are clear and well understood. Second is, he divided the entire Sangh, the entire organization, first into two levels, 
that is like a corporate headquarters he selected even before the first act his 11 principal disciples like the board of directors and these are called gandhas they are with the highest level of competence knowledge and following once he does that then he divides his organization sang into four folds like products male ascetics female ascetics male householders and female householders so the four lines are very clear that where do you belong and what is the role that you play and how you have to perform to achieve excellence so he defines his headquarter organization he defines his you know product groups for uh, mass uh, i mean propagation and each wing is headed the product lines are headed by a person so there is a well identified person a male or a female according to the line who is in charge of these and these gandhas are given responsibilities for field organization and from you know interpretation of what the chief says to the rest then we see the hierarchy itself in the sang in the in the ascetic sang we have the preceptor the acharya then we have the teacher holy teacher or like the technical wing who teaches and then we have the practitioners similarly in the <coughs> laity we have different grades we call the beginners then the middle level and then the serious as pakshik nastik and sadhak the, th the three levels are identified very well in both of these so that people know that as they move up where do they go what can happen to them and the criteria for each are very well documented that once you attain this level you become promotable to that particular level then there is staff organization also we find mention of staves who are like staff you know the hr people or the administration people and we have you know others called ganis he these are the technical experts who even advise the acharya on scripture and technical matters so you see the involvement of the organization very well defined ex roles identified etc so this is what we see that these are and only acharya in a sang is authorized for administration and implementation of the conduct so these are the some of the things which are very well documented now we we also know that in an organization there will be instances where people don't perform there are some mistakes some corrections are required so we have a tremendous literature on discipline in fact in our text like yesterday we were talking it has been termed even as humility vine vine and anushasan discipline are sort of merged together that is not out of anger that you discipline someone is with a feeling of fellow being that you start disciplining and they like you see the term non uh, non violent term we use you know sarna that is you when if somebody makes a mistake you remind him that you made a mistake varna want and the third is you know that you call uh, punishment and it's not physical or corporal punishment it's like ignore ignoring is the biggest punishment you can inflict on anybody i am the director of finance and my chairman says from today you are not the director of finance your salary per kg stay same but now from today onwards you are officer on special duty you have nothing to do so you ignore him and that is the biggest punishment so ignoring and these are some of the principles observe silence social boycott these are some of the punishment non violent punishments which you find being practiced and then how to give command if i tell my junior go do it he has a different feeling and if i say you may like to do this same thing you see a different cooperative feeling and mahavir always used to word use the word ichha kar 
as you please. Somebody comes, Lord, I want to do this. He will never say yes or no. He will say as you please. Okay? So these are the words that we see, how they can affect our... And then we have the description about Pratikaman, Christ Church, repentance, visiting your mistakes again. Like in management, we have management reporting, MIS, auditing, and then taking corrective action or feedback system. These are very well documented, and these are the principles we have to use more for self-correction rather than other methods of coercion, etc. How is my time going? I still have time, or can I stop? Okay, I'll try to finish it up in five minutes. So you see that I, I, here I'm trying to show you the application of the three principles in ONM. We have talked about all this. I will just issue on, you know, nonviolence. Let us take like uh, compassion, live and let live, and living beings help each other. Equal opportunities to all promote work culture, carefulness, and forgiveness. This is very important. I am a deputy to somebody. I make mistakes. Sack me or try to rehabilitate me. If I am not rehabilitated, then you take the action. But there has to be a feeling that it has to come. Anikant, multiplicity of viewpoints. We have to see the well-being of all stakeholders. And this can involve a number of actions like compulsory retirement. I was surprised when I read the history literature of Jains, which has shown and proves that an emperor, if he dies as an emperor, he goes to hell. And if an emperor, if he renounces his empire after some time and practices spirituality, he attains liberation. These are the type of strong indications that are given of, you know, how one should not get attached to the position. Okay. So like these, you know, merging own corporate identity into other corporations because we are talking of organization as an independent entity and internationalization of operations. Today, as I told you in the beginning, the world is becoming global. So a lot of times this becomes a necessity. And these are the, you know, these come from a multiplicity of viewpoints doctrine. Ethics, you know, ethics, they deal day-to-day -day practices, what is right, what is wrong, what I should do, what I should not do. There are a lot of these things. Jains always believe, say three things. Whatever you do has a re reaction. What do you do in a particular situation is to maximize good over bad. Okay, because whatever you do, some bad thing will happen, but the guiding principle is you maximize good and minimize bad. And for this, we have a code of conduct called Anugrat. Acharya Tulsi, you know, he gave up a system of Anugrat Andolan, the five minor voice, non-violence, limiting violence, not speaking the truth, or speaking the truth, non-stealing, observing calibacy, and limiting possessions. These are very well documented, and we can see these principles. If they become a guide in the ONM, you know, procedures, a lot of problems can, ever, can be solved in the organization. Oh, sorry. To conclude, I would say, if we see the Western history also, whatever I have said today is supported even by the Western history. I was reading books on Roman Empire and where I found that conditions in a society that are indicative of decay and fall of Roman Empire, many have commented as to the reason for the decline, including the most thorough analysis undertaken by Edward Gibbon in 8th century. There seems to be general agreement that the causes were internal, within, as opposed to being overcome by a superior external force. One of the main reasons cited is the gradual loss of civic virtue, the virtue of the leaders causing the leader 
become corrupt by excessive powers they held and active to preserve and enhance their own selfish ends at the expense of others. As a result, a great disparity between rich and poor was created. The excess wealth for a small minority led to the extravagant display of wealth and outward flow. We see this happening in India. We see it happening everywhere. A few of us become so rich and they display wealth so much that other weak people like me, we get enamored and we try to copy them. And the problem starts. So, sir, I have tried to put some of the principles in brief about gens and how they can be helpful in developing a new management or a new paradigm based on spirituality. Thank you very much.